Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. My name is Mitra Soret. I'm the Executive Director of Parent Information Center of Delaware. And um, we are so glad that you're able to join us this morning. Joining us uh, today um, to discuss the parent's role in the IFSP or Individualized Family Service Plan is Christina Horton, Part C Coordinator um, for the State of Delaware. And before, I, um, before Christina gets started, a little bit about our organization. Parent Information Center has been in existence since 1983, and our role is to provide support to parents and caregivers, as well as advocates um, as it relates to improving outcomes for children with disabilities or special health care needs. And our, our mission is to improve the health and educational outcomes for children and youth by educating them, their families, um, and the professionals who serve them and empowering them as well. We have a number of programs and services to support families, our PTI, our Parent Training Center, our Family to Family Health Information Program, our Educational Surrogate Parent Program, Doula Program, um, Family Shape Project, our Youth Leadership Program, and our newly um, a, a formed Delaware Public Education Ombudsman Program. And these are all ways to provide advocacy and support to parents and uh, children and the professionals who serve them. And so these are some of the ways that we're able to support families through one-on-one -on -one consultations, learning opportunities, such as the one that you're participating in today. We have a, a number of resources that are available on our website at www.pickofdell.org. And we also um, partner with community organizations and other stakeholders in our outreach, outreach efforts, as well as systems advocacy. And so today, um, we hope that you will learn the purposes and components of the IFSP, the family's important role in this process, and steps to take when preparing for IFSP meetings. And so I'll now turn it over to Christina Horton. Thank you, Midra. Uh, thank you everyone for coming today. I appreciate you for being here. Uh, we definitely hope that you gather some meaningful information from today's talk, and we hope that um, you are prepared to support your families and support your community members who may be receiving services through early intervention services. So um, for children, for infants and toddlers who are eligible um, for early intervention services, they have a right to, to access supports from the Birth to Three Early Intervention Program. Um, so it's, the services are also extended to families. Um, the whole goal and focus of early intervention services is to give parents um, assistance in expanding their own capacity and their own ability to support their children's development. So every child who is Part C eligible, which is what we call eligible infants and toddlers with disabilities, has a right to these services. So early intervention is about teams working together. That is such a critical piece of how the program works. As I said before, the program is meant to assist parents in really their ability to provide supports for their infants and toddlers with developmental delays and disabilities. So um, the infants are the, excuse me, the um, IDEA was established by um, Congress in 1986 and IDEA stands for Individuals with Disability Education Act. And it supports a concept where professionals as well as family members, community members, whoever the family um, supports are, work as a team to really identify the unique developmental needs of children and their families, and to also develop and implement a plan of early intervention services so that those unique needs are met. So when thinking about Delaware specifically and the Birth Free Early Intervention Program in our state, um, we are providing services uh, to families and infants and toddlers who are eligible and have a developmental delay or disability. Um, again, this is really our opportunity to provide supports to the families and link them with key services and supports that will better help the family um, support the children and support themselves as a family. There are opportunities for um, abilities to advocate. We partner with PIC, um, not only in conversations like this one, but also in ensuring that families are aware of their rights 
as part of um, our program and that they're able to advocate and really work together with the professionals in their communities to provide ongoing opportunities for their children, be it learning and developmentally. So who is eligible exactly for early intervention services? There are two ways that um, children are determined eligible for early intervention services. There is um, one way where there's developmental delay that is determined through um, a process where a lot of information is gathered and um, a, when a delay is identified, that information determines eligibility. And then there's also a diagnosed physical or mental condition with a high probability of resulting in a developmental delay that can um, determine a child and their family eligible for early intervention services. And with this in mind, you'll see here that the, this is a quick view of what our early intervention system looks like. So we start with the referral process. Um, when families are identified as having concerns for the development of their children, they are referred to the early intervention program. From there, the um, family and the child go through our assessment and evaluation processes, um, which inform eligibility. When eligibility is determined, then additional assessment information is gathered for the family and all the information um, that was gathered from the evaluation process and the assessment process informs the individualized family service plan. And that's where we're going to focus our conversation on today. You'll see here, oh, oh, go ahead. Um, so the individualized family service plan. This is a written out plan that really guides the way that early intervention services are provided to children and their families. So you can look at this as a blueprint or your GPS for your journey through the program. And it really talks about how the program is going to work to meet the child and their family's unique needs. So there are some requirements that are, um, that are needed in order for the IFSP to be compliant and to meet the needs of the family. The main components that a child's individualized family service plan must include are the current levels of development, um, family's resources, priorities, and concerns related to their child's development. And this is important because if a family agrees to this information, then it will be included. If the family declines to share this information, it will not prevent them from receiving early intervention services. However, it, this information is valuable to us because it helps us to better inform how we are to provide services to the child and their family. The results or outcomes to be achieved by the child and the family, um, early intervention services that the child and family will receive, where these, these services will be delivered to the family, and then transition planning as a child approaches age three. All of these are components that must be included in the child's individualized family service plan. So, in the process of developing the IFSP, as we said before, early intervention is a teaming approach. So there are multiple people who are to be involved or included in the IFSP teaming process. This includes parents, a service coordinator, which is designated by um, the regional programs, which are known as Child Development Watch or CDW. And the service coordinator is responsible for um, coordinating services for the family and implementing the IFSP. Any person who is directly responsible for conducting the evaluation and assessment, um, advocates or people outside of the family that the parent would like to have there with them, and also as appropriate, individuals who will be, who will be providing early intervention services to the child or the family. So um, as I said, the service coordinator is really working to not just um, document everything and really put the IFSP in place, but they are also there to ensure that whichever services are um, part of the IFSP, they're being implemented effectively into the families, you know, to meet the family's needs. What is your role in all of this? Um, so as a family, uh, particularly as parents, you really want to prepare for the, the evaluation and assessment processes. You really want to get as much information as possible that really speaks to your child's development and any needs that they may have had, any concerns that you may have had in 
many settings because all of this information directly informs how the IFSP is developed. So the more information you have from any child care setting or early care and education program that the child that your child is in, any type of feedback or input from family members that take care of your children as you maybe you go to work or whatever the case may be. Whoever is around the child and can give some information about their development is going to be critical. Um, and that, that information, as I said, is going to inform the IFSP. At the time of the IFSP meeting, your participation is critical. Again, the parent's role is to really guide how the services are put in place because this, the IFSP is meant to meet the needs of the child and, your, and their family. You also are included in preparing for a transition. So again, all of the IFSP documentation, all of the information that is used for the IFSP directly informs how the, you and your child will go through the program, which includes transition. So that information definitely helps when we look to your family's exit from the program, whether that means that you're going to the school district for additional services, or you're being you know, uh, moved into additional services after your child turns three. So all of this information really helps us to give rich, rich support to you and your family and your child especially. Um, there's also your role for keeping records. Make sure that every shred of paper that comes to you from the program is kept safe and secure so that you can refer back to that information whenever you need to. Or you know, if, if any questions come up, or any concerns come up, you have all the documentation right at your fingertips so that you can use that, not just to make sure that things are going well, but to advocate for your child as you go through the program. And then finally, you also want to communicate with the child's providers. So your providers are there to provide a service and it's your right to make sure that services are meeting your needs as a family and the needs of your child based on the IFSP. So communicating with the child's providers, make sure that you are getting what you need. And if there are concerns, you're airing them out appropriately so that we can work together and go back to that teaming approach to ensure that services are delivered at a high quality and also appropriately. And I just want to add that um, if you ever have questions um, in this process, you can always reach out to PIC as well or your family service coordinator. Um, and, but we do have staff, dedicated staff that can assist you with any questions or if you're not sure what records to keep, um, or if you just need to talk through that with someone, we have that, um, we have staff on hand that are available to assist you through that. Yes, thank you, Major. All right, so now let's dig into the outcomes or goals that really drive the individualized family service plan. So as part of the IFSP, there are outcomes that are based on the assessment information, um, as you see here, functional authentic assessment information which means that the information is, is based on the child, your child's needs. It's based on their current level of functioning in the family. How are they able to go through their routines? How are they able to accomplish various tasks that are based on their, their developmental age? Once those outcomes are identified, then the placement services and supports based on what is necessary to reach these outcomes is determined. So we're really working first to understand as a family, what do you need? Where is your child functioning the best? What does it look like when they're having a really good day? What does a bad day look like? Or what does a day where you're really having some difficulties or struggles, what does that look like? So that we can provide services that meet both of those needs. We want to build on your child's strengths and your strengths as a family. And we also want to plug in supports where it's needed, where you're having some challenges. So the IFSP, as far as outcomes are concerned, must include a statement of measurable results or outcomes that are expected to be achieved for the child and the family. So this also includes preliteracy and language skills that are developmentally appropriate for children. And that can look like a lot of different things. Um, preliteracy and language skills can be very creative um, and the IFSP can speak to those, to those types of skills based on whatever the, the needs of, are the family or your child. The IFSP must also include criteria, procedures, and timelines that are used to determine the degree 
to which progress toward achieving the results or outcomes is being made. So in other words, uh, we're really needing to also include what it would look like when this is achieved. How long will it take us to get there? And when we get there, how are we going to evaluate that we've reached the level of mastery or if not mastery, how have we reached the goal or whatever that may look like? Okay, so there are two types of outcomes that we're going to dig into today. And these two types of outcomes are included on your IFSP. There are child outcomes, which directly um, relate to how the services will affect and support the child. And then there are family outcomes, which really relate to how supports and services will affect or support the family. So moving into child outcomes, there are participation-based outcomes, which really looks like um, the child's ability to engage in certain activities, um, engage in developmentally um, appropriate activities that are you know, needed throughout their day. Then there is routines-based um, outcomes, which directly relate to mealtime or you know, different activities throughout your day specifically that there's, there's a need for um, developing an outcome. So these child outcomes should really enhance learning through functional participation, where the child is really learning. They're really in an environment and in a situation where they can foster some really good learning skills. It should also be important and meaningful to the family and caregiver. So the outcomes for the child must be priorities for the family. Um, we're also basing these outcomes on a child's interest. So as we know, if a child is interested in our activities, then we can really build on skills that are helpful and are really going to help us reach our outcomes with the IFSP. As for family outcomes, again, you see the participation based, which could really enhance the capacity of the family's ability to support their child, which could include learning or really working with other provider agents or providers in the home with the IFSP to develop that support for their children. There are also resource-based outcomes, which looks like um, accessing community resources and support. And your service coordinator will help work with you through that, along with other agents or providers working towards the IFSP. Um, again, these outcomes need to be meaningful to the family. As a part of the team, your goals and your priorities are what really drive the IFSP. So if it's important to you, then that needs to be listed on the IFSP so that we can meet those important needs that you have. All right, so when thinking about additional ways to, that additional information that needs to be included in the IFSP, which is a criteria procedure and timelines, there are certain questions that are really going to help guide how you make decisions on your IFSP and how you really develop these outcomes. So as part of this process, your service coordinator and, and the other um, team members are going to think about the main ways in which the family and team will work together toward achieving the outcome. You will identify who on the IFSP team will help and if there's a need for reaching out um, beyond the IFSP team, how will we do that and what will they help to do? And then how will we know that we've made progress or if we need to make some changes to the outcomes or services? These key questions here are going to really help inform what services are put in place and how we will work to see, to see how effective the services are. Okay. So the outcomes should be functional, meaning that they are necessary for your child and family's life. It's, uh, you know, something like going up the stairs or, you know, if you live in an area where the child needs to be safe or whatever the case may be, it's necessary and functional so that you and your child can really have a, a very positive and, and um, um, meaningful experience as your child develops. Um, there should be a reflection of real life settings. So we're not necessarily looking to put children in clinic settings. 
um, if the service can be provided in an environment where the child is normally just normally living their lives, this is where we would like to have services take place. Um, these outcomes should be jargon free, meaning there shouldn't be words that are not understood. It should be very clear and very simple. The language should be so that whoever reads this IFSP can know exactly what's happening and exactly what's going on, whether they are an early intervention specialist or provider or someone who has no knowledge of what early intervention means. There should also be an emphasis on positive development. So we're not really looking at what we won't do with an IFSP. We're looking at how we can support and what we will do in order to make sure that services are put in place to meet the developmental needs of the child and to meet the needs of your family. Okay, so we've talked about how we create these outcomes. So now I wanna think about how these outcome measures are put into the IFSP process. So as we talked about earlier, the IFSP really puts supports in place to address priorities and to support successful participation in daily activities of the lives of the child and the family. So these outcomes or goals are really built on the interests, the skills that the child already has so that we can reduce barriers to the successful participation. Again, if we're not interested in it, then it's a little harder to really reach success compared to when we are interested in something and when we're really ready and excited to learn about it. So we really want to build on the interests of your family. We want to build on the interests of your children so that we can really promote the success of participating in these everyday daily learning opportunities. So we also, again, want to do this through participation. Um, children learn by doing. So we want to make sure that we give lots of opportunities for the IFSP to reflect participating in those daily learning So here are some examples of early intervention services that are commonly accessed by early uh, children and families who are eligible to receive services. Um, this is service coordination. Every family who comes through the program is assigned a service coordinator, and that service coordinator will remain with you through your entire journey with the program. So that is a service that is required to be accessed by the families who are in our program. Um, there are home visits, social work services special instruction. In Delaware, we call this early childhood education or EPE. There are also um, therapeutic services to include physical therapy, um, occupational therapy, and speech language pathology. There are also nutrition services. If there is a family who requires the need for sign language, we can provide that as well. Audiology support, vision services. Those types of, these are types of um, services that we provide to families and they're commonly accessed. This is not an exhaustive list, I will say, of what services can be offered. All right, so in addition to the services that we provide as a, the early intervention program, there are lots of additional resources through your communities, through the internet that you can access so that you're better prepared to meet the needs of um, your family. And more importantly, you know, your family as you create um, positive experiences and, and developmental opportunities for your children. Um, the Birth to Three Early Intervention Program has a wonderful, strong partnership with PIC of Delaware. Um, so you'll see their information here as an additional resource. Uh, the Birth to Three Early Intervention Program is housed under the Department of Health and Social Services. So you'll also see our website on here as well. Um, there are national uh, centers that house information for early childhood, um, early intervention services, and you can find that here as well. All right, so we appreciate your time. Uh, we will open the floor for questions at this time and we really appreciate you taking some time to listen. Are there any comments about the early intervention program? Does anybody have any 
comments or questions that they would like to ask. I don't see any questions. Thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Christina, and giving us all of this wonderful information. Um, as Christina stated, we are here and available. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us um, through our, our uh, website, uh, pickadell.org, or our telephone number is 302-999-7394. Uh, please share this information with a parent. Uh, and I hope that everyone has a great day. Thank you. All right. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you.